Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining me in the last session of today. Uh, of course, you'll be excited for the party this evening. Um, I hope that I can get you entertained uh, for, for this uh, coming hour, small hour. Um, this is the session title. If you're in the wrong room, that's your moment to quickly switch. And uh, I'll be showing code as well. So if you, if you have trouble reading smaller letters, smaller fonts, don't hesitate to come a little bit more closer. Um, we're going to talk about data quality, but first let me introduce me quickly. Uh, my name is Dave Ruiter, I, I'm from the Netherlands. I'm a solution architect, data engineer, ML engineer. I do a lot of stuff, all regarding uh, data. I uh, have almost uh, two decades uh, experience. Um, if you need me to help you out to slay some dragons, data issues, platform deployments, um, yeah, reach out to me. A couple of ways to do that. All right. So, my solution to having no more data quality issues, just simply don't check for data quality. Uh, of course, that's not a solution. Um, you'll end up in a situation like this. They'll be calling you, hey Dave, Friday afternoon, pipeline failed. Um, please, maybe a small raise of hands, if you've ever had a pipeline failing because of data issues, Yes, right, all of us. It's maybe the primary reason for pipelines to fail, of course. So uh, I struggled with that, and unfortunately, Microsoft, Power BI, they don't have an out-of-the-box easy solution for this. So I checked online um, what kind of options we had uh, yeah, to do that. And luckily, because of yeah, the, the maturity of the data platform, of course, the solutions that we do, People build some stuff, so that's good. We're going to take a look at uh, one of the leading uh, open source frameworks for that. Uh, but first, a little introduction in data quality, um, because yeah, sometimes we're talking not about the same thing, of course. So let's uh, um, get that out of the way. For me, um, it can be a couple of things um, when we talk about data quality. The most important thing, of course, is when inputs are wrong. Um, the data in the system is incorrect. But it can also be that you think the data quality is not good, but your expectation of it is just wrong. Maybe you thought that this column is supposed to be an integer, a birth date, uh, but the system owners, the people designing the system, or the people using the system, just use it in a different way. And that's not per se always incorrect. You need to just have a proper understanding, of course, of what's going on. And like the last thing is a bit related, but it can also be outdated. Just, you need to, you need to yeah, be on top of this. Users and uh, like the, the end users, but also the, 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 um, the people managing systems, they might just use a column from one day to the other day in, enough, in another way. They think, okay, it's good that we just flip this around. And then you, as an end consumer of the data, might just, uh, yeah feel that pain. Uh, you need to be on top of that. All right. Um, the package, the, the library framework, I'll use that work, that, that, those words in, um, yeah, a lot. Uh, I don't know the, the English words for that. Um, it's called Great Expectations. Can you quickly ha raise your hand if you ever used this, heard of it before? Okay, a couple. That's nice. Uh, I see coworkers, people in the community, using it more and more. I started using this like over a year ago. Uh, I'm, I'm a fan of it. Um, it's not easy to use. I see, I saw a lot of people struggle with it within my clients, also uh, friends in the community. So I thought, okay, let's do a session on it. What can it do for you? Well, it's really good in data validations, of course. But it can also generate the documentation of what your expectations are of the data, your, your rules, that you think, okay, it should be like this, it can document that very easily for you. So you have this, you know, this space where you can go and see, okay, what, what is it that we think this should be? And, and colleagues can go there and yeah, you get this common language of what your uh, data expectations are. And also uh, the last category, it can help you to um, get a better understanding of the data using things like data profiling. It has assistance that it can use. You can point it to your data, and then you, um, you, you can better understand that. So that's also one of the tools that it can, can give you. Um, 
What is the approach then? How you would start doing this? Um, maybe, you know, obvious, but I wanted to not skip this step is you need to first define what you think is your expectation of the data. You need to somewhere type it in, write it down, have it in your code base. Because of course you cannot just say, so, like a framework here, go and test my data. It doesn't know what, you, what it needs to be. So that's an important uh, yeah, part of your approach. And yeah, if you start doing this, um, applying a framework like great expectations, you'll see that it becomes a part of your rhythms, your way of working. Maybe um, your definition of done when you develop a new feature in your, in your solution. You need proper data expectations for it, registered, tested. Um, yeah, so that's also really important. And then, of course, you need to add the validation steps in your workflows. It might be manual, might be part of your development uh, yeah, steps, but also, of course, in your uh, production environment, you need maybe before, after, intermediate, uh, some steps to execute the real validations. And then when you have that in place, it's important to have a feedback loop. You just need to regularly check, hey, does it, does it give me a lot of outputs that, that I don't expect? Is my data expectation not as expected? Um, and, and then you sort of improve your, your set of rules. You improve your expectations of the data uh, in a continuous cycle. All right. And let me also say, if you have a question that's like, you think it's appropriate for now in this moment, just raise your hand at that, at that time. No, no, uh, no problem with that. And otherwise, at the end, we'll have some time this le uh, left as well. OK. So I mentioned the word expectations a lot. And yeah, the library that we're going to take a look at also is called Great Expectations. So um, what is that? Well, um, an expectation is a, um, a verifiable statement about your data. Um, it's also like a sort of language to talk about the characteristics of your data. And um, you can use it from like a human to a human, uh, but also um, the library can understand it. So it's also a human to machine uh, language. And in the end, I'll show you a couple examples. It's a JSON statement. I'm not, I'm not sure if I am a fan of the JSON uh, language, but uh, that's how it is. And here are a couple of examples. So um, we can have uh, a statement that a column needs to exist. Pretty standard, pretty easy, but from one day to the other, your source might, have, might not have that column anymore. And you want to test this right before you start all of your processes. So nothing like really bad happens, and you know it immediately. Um, table row counts, obviously, one of the easy and important things to check, but also uh, more like deeper inside the table. You can check for um, a column uniqueness, column cannot be null, but also the value must be between a certain range and more difficult, complex things like a regex match. Uh, this is just, an, just a quick um, selection of examples. There are currently over 300 of these expectation types that will help you to describe yeah, your expectation of the, of the data. Um, so if you want, on the website of Great Expectations, there's a URL not shown. Oh, it's, it's, it's there, yes. My angle doesn't show it, okay. Yes, um, go to the website, uh, expectation gallery. You can quickly browse through it, read the documentation of a certain expectation type, and then, um, yeah, see, see if what you think should be there if it's already in the library, you can start using it. Um, yeah, really important. I go there regularly. I try to keep, keep track of what they add uh, as expectation types. OK. Um, an example, really simple one. Expectation type is I want the column values to not be null. And I have an argument set where it's like the column ID. Really simple. Second example is I want it. Uh, to match a regular expression, which column is it about, the first name, and then I provide it with the expression. Um, this, is, this is simple. The, there are multiple expectations that have like four or five options of, of arguments that you give it. 
And yeah, who, who would, who's like really enthusiastic of writing these JSON statements for their data expectations? <laughs> Nobody, right? I even like um, try to create this sort of app that I could just as a sort of UI, select this type and then which column, but it's a lot of work to create that. And there are also multiple other existing options already. Um, this is just a graph that I, that I took from the website from Great Expectations. Um, from the top left, um, the, one of the biggest information yeah, sources to, to create those expectations are your experts. Maybe you yourself have, uh, have a lot of domain knowledge. Usually in my role as a consultant, data engineer, I don't have the deepest knowledge of every column in every source. And also that's like assumptions uh, most of the time because I look at the data, I know, okay, I've been told to use this column in a certain way, assume, assuming that that's the correct column. So um, ask more user experts. And then they might also look at the data and use introspection to, to Think about, okay, what, sh what should the, da the data look like? And um, that then flows into expectations. You can see the font is a bit small. It doesn't work. Um, but you can read it prob probably there's like profilers, also called data assistants, that can help you. You can point it to the data, and then it will profile the data and say, okay, I see now two distinct values. Probably that's normal. Here's a rule that checks that you have all of, all of them too, or um, that, that the values that it finds are at least in this set. So they, yeah, you can play with that, help it um, to yes, let it assist you to create those expectations. Uh, in the demo later, I'll show you how to do that. All right. Um, I think, let's check it out. All dark. Um, okay, so in my platforms, I think I'll have to make a duplicate screen now. Give that a second to load. Okay, let me know if I should zoom in more. I can do zoom it, but I try to um, also increase the browser zoom level. Uh, I use Databricks for all of my data transformations. Um, I understand uh, that's not what you all might, might do, um, but the library that we're taking a look at, Great Expectations, um, is a Python library. So um, this is, you know, it works perfectly inside my world. Um, if you use Azure Synapse Analytics, uh, no problem at all. You can use the same thing as Databricks. Uh, you use a, a Spark notebook, Python-based code, and you're good to go. Um, if you're like a pure Power BI um, engineer, developer, and you're curious how you can do this in Power BI, we'll come to that uh, in, a, in, in a later demo. Um, interesting. Um, all right, so Databricks. I try to find a, a good example to work with, and Databricks provides a couple of uh, data sets that you can use. And I wanted to show you that because not everybody used, uh, knows that. And it's great for just thinking around and, and sharing demos without sharing um, your, your uh, sensitive company data in, in a group of people that are not allowed to see that. So uh, we have some data sets for airlines, Amazon, a lot of data sets. And I went into the, <clears throat> the learning Spark set and right there, there is a people data set. And when we explore that, it's 10 million rows of, of people data. All right. It has an ID column, some text, a birth date, um, social security numbers, and salary. And let's assume this is our base data. This should be all correct. Um, let's explore. And before I import the package, I'll first show you a 
my, my cluster, and that I have added the great expectations package on the cluster. Uh, it's a package that's available on, um, on PyPy. Um, it is updated almost weekly. Almost every week they have an incremental update. And we're now at version 16.1 or 0.16.1. Um, yeah. So that I have added that. And also two others that I use to authenticate to uh, a storage account. Uh, you, can, you can ignore that a bit. We'll come to that maybe later. The only one that's now really important is this one. And let's import it and then use it. So um, I created a data frame before. DF is spark.read.load from a certain path, the, the path that Databricks provides for that sample data set. And the DF is now a variable that contains that data frame. And what I do here in command 9 is that I uh, convert it using the GX. Remember, GX is, is the abbreviation for great expectations, to a data set uh, that it knows. So it's a sort of little wrapper around the default Spark data frame. And then what you can do is call that and see uh, what, it, what it has out of the box. So I just type expect, and then I can just scroll down, and I have all of the expectations that are available in this Spark uh, context. You might be counting like, oh, that's not 300. Um, some of them, or like Spark is only a selection of all of those 300. You, there's also um, Pandas and SQL, uh, SQL only um, expectation types. Uh, so OK, this is a little bit less than 300, but still a lot of different types. I have a couple of examples prepared. For instance, the expect column values to be of type string or the ID column. And then the result is immediately available. And it says, OK, I observed the integer type. So OK, Dave, that was not correct. Uh, the success was not good. It was false. And it has um, a little information about the configuration that I, that I passed it, like what type, what input that I give it. So you can just um, start doing this, exploring it. like. Yeah, OK. Immediately, I have this toolbox of things that I can apply to validate the data. And on ad hoc situations, when you don't know the data set, when you don't know if you are going to put this in production, this is, this is OK. This is fine. Just with an import statement, and then a convert to, to a, a little wrapper data frame, I have all of these functions available. And I can yeah, let it check for me. And this is a 10, 10 million. Um, Rows record set, of course not that not that wide, but it's it's really fast, like 35, um, 0 0.35 seconds, and it's uh, it it has done this check, and so we continue. We check. Are they are they unique? Well, let's find out. And it says, yeah, true, they were, and so we can also check. If a column exists, well, this dummy column, it wasn't there. Um, what if you have a situation where like, you have this threshold, where you know this column, um, it should not be null in most of the cases. And there's this threshold, like what, what does most mean? They implemented that with this threshold, and uh, 0.95. It means 95%. And now I can just um, check. And there will be a threshold. And it, if um, up until it falls below this threshold, the, um, the, the, the check will, will pass. And if there will be uh, um, less than 95% um, yeah, matching, it will fail. Um, so that's also something that you can uh, consider. And, uh, how I've done this, little little best practice or tip is like um, maybe sometimes you don't know yet, put threshold a little bit lower, and then with that feedback loop, you just raise it higher and higher, um, so you can uh, yeah get even more control over your validations. And you can also do this to maybe have uh, one check, and that's um, really high. Like you just say the entire column needs to be not null. And when that fails, 
Do you, like if you're not really certain, maybe you don't fill your data pipeline. We'll come to that later, how you fill your data pipeline using this. And then you have another expectation where you say, okay, mostly, um, and that is maybe lower, 80%, 70%, somewhere that you think, okay, I'm pretty certain it will never occur that it will drop below that. And that's the one that, that fills your pipeline. So you have a sort of stepped approach, a, 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 yeah, a layered approach. So that's a, the first intro of this great expectations library. And you can see with just a couple of lines of code, you can already start using it. Um, but how do you run this? How do you run this in uh, your production scenario? Will you just have a notebook and all of these lines below each other? I can tell you, you'll have hundreds of these statements because every column will have a couple of expectations. Some tables have 20 plus columns and then you have multiple tables. So it, that's not really doable to have them all written out like this. So then how do you do that? Well, they, they thought about that, the grid expectations library, and they have this concept called the data context. And it is sort of, yeah, a box that contains all of your information, your configuration, um, things like where to store the results, and then um, all of your configurations. And that's really, uh, yeah, easy to use. But now we already start to see a little bit of the compli uh, complexity of this package. I have a slide to help with that. There it is. So this data context. Um, on the left, you'll see it has a bit of your setup. So uh, you configure the stores. And stores, in our context, is just basically folders to store the um, expectations, but also things like the output and a path to store the data documentation that it can create, many things. You also specify in your data context where your data source is. In our uh, usage of, of this framework, I only provided just a data frame, Spark data frame in memory. So this is for us not really important, but I know, if, yeah, you can do a lot with these data sources. And I use it with this, like a data frame, Maybe you have a folder on your data lake that you want to point it to, and then it, it can read it on the fly. It's capable of doing that. And the third category of your data context are the expectations. Um, it, and that's like, yeah, I'll leave it to that, expectations. And the fourth one is the ability to help you to validate your data. How does it do that? With things like checkpoints. I think the name is a bit, Weird, but checkpoints are, yeah, pointers to, to, to validate your data. Little config about, okay, I have this sales data, I have this people set that we have been now exploring, and I want you to validate it for me. And it's all set up like this, because it, there's so many things you can do. They have made it sort of, yeah, um, abstract. A bit too abstract in my taste, but they are improving that uh, uh, little by little. Um, okay, so data context. In the end, really concrete, it is a YAML file. And we, I, we talked about data sources, right? I have one data source. I'll zoom in a bit. Um, and this data source is of type Spark, Spark Data Frame Execution Engine. And I have also uh, yeah, been playing around with specif specifying a couple of parameters, like uh, what is the stage of my pipeline that I'm executing this in? Uh, I, I think a run ID is really useful. So those are standard batch identifiers that I, that I give it. Um, I also talked about the stores. You can specify here, uh, where do I store my expectations, my validations, so the output of my, my, my runs, and a couple other things. Something else here, yes. The, the data docs, I'll show you what that really is, but that's like a HTML page uh, that it outputs. Um, where does it store that? Well, in my case, I have a 
storage account. That's my target where it needs to store this HTML website. So all of those things might be a little bit intimidating right now. You're like, okay, I'll see when I start working with it, I'll come back to this. Yes, I understand, but that's like how it is. We need to set this up before we can really go to the next level of this, this, this uh, package. So next notebook is go up. initializing the data context. And it's a simple statement, that's, that's good. What does it do? It will check if it can find this YAML file in the current working directory, and it, expect, it expects a folder called Great Expectations um, in, the, in the default setup. So that's easy. Uh, you can manipulate that by uh, initializing uh, uh, yeah, and overriding that, that way of working with this example code. And then as we talked about the data contact context, it knows um, yeah, where to store things, basically. We can call the data context and say, hey, you have this concept of data sources, and we now can verify, yes, it has, it has read the YAML file correctly, and we can continue. So we read the data. We make a thing called a runtime batch request, and we call our data frame. So here above, a little quickly, but you have the data frame again, and I pass it along to the runtime. And now it's time to let it do its thing again. So we have this validator, and I'll share all the notebooks and slides uh, so you can play around this yourself. Um, and you can see, okay, we have again, expect table row count. We have above another one, column values to be between for the salary column in this case. And I say, okay, it's between with a minimum value of zero and no maximum value. So it's not technically a between anymore, but this is like really uh, the way it works. And it does its thing. So we, um, we, we validate the data, but because we're now using this validator, it keeps track of all of those validations. Um, I'm going to skip this for the sake of time. So uh, we, um, we used the validator and we executed again, we added again a couple of validation rules. And now it's time to explore how it can save that for us. And we provide it with a JSON file name and now, perhaps I can show you that, is that in this folder called expectations, we actually have this file called expectations for people manually something something. And that's exactly what I told it to name it. And if we open up that JSON file, you'll see it has the the rules that I just executed in here. So remember I was talking about the salary, it needs to be minimum zero and row count, also some minimum value. We have three expectations in this, in this set. Um, and this is now a file that we can put in source code um, and we can use for runs in production. So that, that's really handy. And also I can Go back to the notebook, to the bottom. I can now also start exploring this feature called the data docs. And we have just created this, this suite of expectations. And if we call the command called build data docs, it will um, create this HTML page for us. Now it's ready. I'll click on it. And we have a, yeah, within a couple seconds, we have an HTML page that we can use. We can host that somewhere centrally within our team, within our organization, and people can browse there and see, okay, what, what is everything, what are the rules that we know with, that we have set up for our data? You see here the one that we just created. Nothing else yet. If we click on it, we drill into it, and so in a bit, we can see we have it a section for table level expectations. 
where it says it must have greater than or equal to 100,000 rows. We also see the ID column values must not be null, the salary column values must be greater than or equal to zero. This is like a tiny little step, but you can already imagine that you can now build this up for all of your tables, all of your columns, and you'll have those hundreds of expectations um, yeah, built up. Um, okay. But do we, do we want to do this manually? Like I talked before, it's a lot. Um, maybe also I don't see all of the things that I need to check. I, I have a lot of common sense on that, but it's difficult to just know what to check for. If you, if you only use your common sense to add rules, there's this blind spot that you, think, that you, that you don't think about. And yeah, that's, that's of course, yeah, not good enough. Um, one other little tip I want to give you, maybe you already know, but uh, data bricks has a data profiler. And if you have a data frame like this, you can let it run, create a data profile. If you really want to do things manually, you can take a look at this data profile and then still create all, the, all of the rules based on the output of this. Uh, of this. So you have the ID column, nothing missing. So maybe, okay, I think, yeah. So I add an expectation that this column cannot be null because apparently there's nothing null, so that must be how it must be. Um, but that's still a bit manual. All right. Do you use expectation, great expectations in a CICD process? Um, I'll leave that for later. Can GX handle tests on columns containing JSON that navigate the elements within the JSON? That question, I don't know that, John. Perhaps you can check out the great expectations library uh, and see if there's any uh, of that. I, there's like an obvious workaround that you just expand those elements yourself first and then let it check. But of course, yeah, that's not preferred. I have never seen an expectation that can do this, but uh, there's a lot, so I don't know yet. Those are the two. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we don't want to create this manually. Not all of them. It's a lot of work. So we go to another notebook. And that's this notebook. I'll go to the top. And one by one, we execute a couple of commands. We read the data again. Just this, the other notebooks, nothing special. We create a run. A batch again, where we say, yes, pass along the data frame. This is just things you don't have to understand right now. But then the interesting thing comes. We can use an onboarding data assistant, how they call it. And that can help you to explore and validate the data um, and quickly ramp up this set of expectations. Is it all good, good, good things? Is it really intelligent? No, but it can help you to, give, to get a baseline and then scratch the things that you think, ah, that's, that's not good. We don't need that. We don't need that. And you, yeah, then you end up with a really good starting point. It has a couple of arguments that you can give it. At, well, first, the batch request. Um, that's basically what data do I need to check. Then um, interesting things like include column names or exclude column names. If you have a data frame that has 100 columns and you only want it to look at 20, you can use those parameters to, to do that. Um, for now, I have pre prepared this include column names to only work on these columns, and I have excluded first name, middle name, just as an example. And then I just say, go and run, do your thing. And this is not 10 million rows of data. That will take three minutes. It's not a lot, but too much for a demo. Now I have it only on 10,000 rows, if I'm correct. And you'll see it outputs some weird diagrams and, and graphs. I think that's just a little bit of Databricks UI things. In a Jupyter notebook, pure Jupyter, this would look better. Um, just ignore all of those bars and scroll down and I see, okay, great. 15 seconds and it's done. But where is it? What did it do? Let's look at the 
return variable that it created. This is a lot of information. So let's look at the real interesting things. I thought I had that available, but let's see. Not sure where that command ended up. No, I'll skip that for now, but there's like an easy command to just limit to only the rules that it created. Uh, for now, I'm going to continue and I'm going to say, okay, nice, you have apparently built this set of rules. Let's save it, and that's this command. I say, get the expectation suite, and we could take a look at that, but I want to say to the context, here you have this suite. I've done some work, the assistant helped me, Please save this expectation suite. And now update this data docs again. This command, we say, hey, update it. And if that's finished, when that's finished right now, we go back to our HTML page, go back to the home page. And now we have this extra set, set that I called made by the assistant. Let's dive into that. And you'll see it has a lot more expectations. So how long did, it, did this take? A couple minutes? And it made a nice set of validations for us. Remember, this is still a JSON file in my, my, my folder. I could open that and read it, but it's a lot easier to just read this. We have the birth date, column cannot be null, and it says, okay, the minimum value must be this date, the maximum value must be this date. I don't think I want to strictly just keep that in my validation rules. That's a high risk that, it, that maybe tomorrow the data is a little bit different, more you know, at, outside of this range. But I could let this feed me and just I'll, I'll subtract a couple years and I think, OK, it's safe. Um, and for the gender column, there is apparently only the F for female because I limited the data. Uh, in the full data set, I also have the M for male and uh, nothing else besides that yet. Uh, so I can let, uh, let this inspire me to create uh, some rules for the gender column. Really helpful. In a project recently, um, me and my team, we used this assistant on all of the 13 uh, source tables in our solution, one of the solutions. And, you know, within a day, we had a good set of rules for every table in, in the list of 13 tables. And uh, yes, we, some of them were incorrect. Like, okay, next day we got an error. Okay, we have, it was too strict. So you, we learned and we, we improved it. And now we have like even doubled that amount of rules over time. Yes. If 90% of the data set is fine, but the 10% fails, um, for instance, ID is null. Can you set it con to consider the whole set to be succeeded, failed, or maybe load only the successful with an alert node, but not handle it as failed? Um, I think I understand, but it, this, is, this is a bit difficult. Um, great expectations is not capable of limiting your data afterwards. It is just only looking at the data and saying, here's a report of it. So um, you can have an automatic step reading the report result, and just saying, OK, I, I want to fail or not fail. But you know, passing the 90% that succeeded and keeping the 10% that did not is something that you would need to wrap around yourself. Um, like I said, I, I implemented two set of rules um, to have a sort of uh, alert set where I was only alerted, hey, Dave, this, this, this data, apparently 10% uh, is, is, is null. Doesn't look good, but I'm not failing the pipeline. Here's an alert, you go look at it. And I had an alert set, a rule set, I must say, where I said, okay, these are the essential critical things. If anything is like uh, not good, fail the pipeline. Because then I cannot guarantee that it's really, really good uh, anymore. So working with, with that uh, two sets of, of rules per, per table really helps in that aspect. I hope that answers the question. Um, second one, are there any questions, uh, changes to the approach when dealing with streaming data frames? Um, I don't think so. I think you can just apply the same things that we just did 
uh, in structured streaming uh, because you can, yeah, it's a sort of micro batch approach where you can say, yes, I apply some Python code for the incoming batch. And new question from Barry, Barry. Can you use this to quarantine the rows that fail and allow rows that pass continue? I think that's a similar question as before, and the answer is no, that, that's not possible. Okay, so we let the, uh, and excuse me if there's questions in the room, but I can't see anything because of the light. So um, just hold on for a couple minutes, and then we have a little Q&A section. Um, I think that is enough for now. Um, let's go back to the slides and continue with this. Um, so for now, we only had a couple notebooks. Yes, it's fine. Uh, if you use notebooks in production, uh, you could just add some commands wherever you want that, uh, cells. Uh, uh, but it might be a really uh, good idea to check out Um, this. So if you have a daily run, this is nice that it zooms everything but the important part. Uh, I only have two tasks here. Extract data, transform data. This is fake scenario, just, just give you an example. Uh, but usually you would have at least these, these steps. And where do you think is, it's important uh, to, to add your validations? You might say, oh, at the beginning, oh, at the end, in the middle, and all of that is true. There's no one point where you should add this. It is extremely important to add it in the beginning to validate your input data, but also your output. You need to know for sure, yes, I have act I, I've uploaded some data in the data lake, in the gold layer, whatever destination, right before you write it, or maybe after you have written it, check it, validate it. Otherwise, the next day, somebody will call you like, this is not good. Uh, how do you do that? Well, take a look. And one example here would be to do it like this. So you have to extract data. And then, as I said, some critical validations and warning validations. And you can see in this path, that um, the, whenever I have a critical validation to fail, I will let this task fail. I will raise an exception, so this task fails. And then the subsequent steps will not be executed, but for the warnings, I can say, okay, this uh, warnings activity, I will not raise an exception if the validations failed. So the validations failed, I had it false in at least one of the rules, but I don't raise an exception. So this task will succeed, it will be green, but that's okay, because it's warnings. And I will have my own system, besides this, to alert me. Um, great Expectations is capable of sending you an alert. You can do that. You could also have, inside this activity, send me an email. There's, there's lots of options, and I, I don't have a demo of that, but. Uh, you, can, you can use your own implementation of that. <clears throat> and the same thing is after the transformations are done, I have all <clears throat> also the critical stuff and the, the warning uh, activity. So again, the critical activity would then fail. Uh, yes, it's after the fact, but it's hopefully before the end user has uh, seen the report. If you don't want it to happen like this, in Databricks, th there's no way to split it up, um, you'll have to um, add this logic to check for the critical validations inside the transform data step with some sub, sub activities or sub notebooks that you activate, uh, run. Okay. Um, then a little bit Power BI. Some slides for in case the demos failed. Okay, Power BI validations. Um, 
What do you want to check with Power BI? Uh, things like this, verifying exact value of a specific order, just to know that that order is inside Power BI and it has the same data. That's maybe not the most important thing to do because Power BI has, of course, measures. And that's where you want to focus on because it can be um, a measure, like th that data is not in the same form available in your data lake or data warehouse because it's depending on the context filtering on a certain year, and maybe uh, then uh, doing a percentage of a time intelligence or, yeah, measures can, of course, do a lot of things. And you want to check what the measures look like. How do you do that? I was thinking that myself. I Googled, and I, of course, check out the blog of Power BI once in a while, and I know that they have uh, published an API to execute queries. Great. How do I use this? in, uh, so I'll come back to this. How do we use that in Python, in my notebook? And I Googled and Kurt has a blog post uh, on this, Kurt from Data Goblins, and I used that. So I basically copy pasted a couple of the, 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 the example codes. So that was really nice. And then what is important here? You're testing the data in the data model, not the reports. That's not possible with this API. And it only works on data in a service, not in desktop. So it's only on published data sets. And the good thing is it does not require premium. This API is also usable for only pro situations. All right. So what do you do? You send a query, a Dux query, in the body of the API call. In this case, evaluate, summarize columns, products, brand class. And then I get a result with a little table in JSON of the values in that uh, response. Now, I have created a notebook to work with that. And here's another example. What this does, it's a little bit um, larger. Uh, it will give me uh, the years and months, and then the orders. And for the sake of time, I'll skip a bit about how it exactly calls that. Um, let me see. And here you have the results. So, um, yeah, in JSON, table with rows with data. I used a, a bit of exploding in Python code to make that a beautiful data frame like this. And from now on, it's a data frame. So we can work with the same... Um, um, steps that we already apply to data frames. We can just have an expectation suite and uh, then call that. It says, okay, I don't have yet the expectation suite, but this is then what you would do. And you would update the data docs and have it available in there as well. So yes, I'm a little bit cheating. I use my same notebook execution way, but it, I think for me, it opened up um, yeah, a big world of Power BI validation in this, this setup. So, uh, I mean, cheating, it's not purely Power BI. If you're only using Power BI, you cannot apply this right away. You would have to have a Python execution environment. What do we need for that? A service principle to talk to the API. We need a couple of settings in the tenant settings to be enabled to call this API. And the, the service principle needs to be added to the workspace containing the data set um, because it needs permissions on that data set. And then that's all you need to do that. There are some limitations, uh, 120 requests per minute and um, uh, one query per API call, one table per call is quite limited. Um, but I think otherwise people will abuse this API to export all the data out of Power BI. It's my uh, suspicion. Um, but you know, if you work with this limit, these limitations, then you can do that. All right. My takeaways on this setup is it's really impressive. It was for me a, a big time saver in the end when I figured it out and had the plumbing in place. Then we could start using it, and then it was a huge time saver. Uh, but it is a bit of a configuration nightmare to set up. I hope that I helped you to do it uh, more easily, that you can reuse my, my scripts, my notebooks, 
I'll publish them on, on GitHub. And yeah, thank you very much. I'll be here. Um, this is the last session, of course, so there's no new speaker coming up. We can just uh, stay here for a couple of questions. Uh, time's up, unfortunately. So thank you very much. Enjoy the party tonight.